Verse 9 says, And when they got out, when they got out on land, came to the beach, now watch this, they saw a fire of coals there and fish lying on it, cooking and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net to land full of large fish, 153 of them, and there were so many of them, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, now watch this, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. But none of the disciples ventured or dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew by this time that it was the Lord. Now, here's the thing that I see. The resurrected Lord of glory appears to his disciples right in their ordinary everyday life. They're just fishing. They're just doing their work. They weren't in a church service. They weren't at a Bible study. They were in their everyday life fishing. He used a little example to bring a little correction. And then he cooks their breakfast. Jesus cooked their breakfast. Jesus, the resurrected Lord of glory, cooked the disciples' breakfast. I'm not going to shut up till you get it. that. I mean, he could have been calling lightning out of heaven. I mean, he could have put on a most impressive show of his power and glory. They could have all been standing there going. And what does he choose to do? He cooks their breakfast. Okay, here we go. Got to apply it to home base. Some of you would be better off instead of prophesying to your family all the time if you would cook their breakfast. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Pressing on. Mark 12, 42, we see a story about the widow who gave two mites. It was everything she had, but to everybody else, it seemed very insignificant, yet she's one of the people that was recorded in the Word of God, and people are still talking about that one little teeny tiny act. And I love this one. In John 20, verse 1, Mary got up early to go to the tomb. I never saw it like this, but really she got up early to seek God. For years in my life, I've gotten up early to seek God. I'll give up sleep to seek God because I finally understand I can't live without Him. Okay, now listen. A little thing. Nobody saw her. Just by herself. Got up early and went to seek God. And maybe everybody else was still sleeping in bed. You may get up early to go seek God and the whole rest of the family may be in bed for a long time. And you don't need to brag about it. You don't need to try to put them down or make them feel bad. You just need to do what you're doing and do it under the Lord. But now look, because she was seeking God early, she got to the tomb before anybody else and Jesus was gone, but an angel appeared. And guess what? Mary, a woman, got to be the first one to preach the gospel. Now, don't ever tell me women can't preach. The angel said to her, go and tell his disciples he is risen. That's preaching. It takes a big person to do little things. Amen? What kind of an image and an attitude do you have of yourself? Some people see themselves as little, 
And they need to lose that little image and begin to come forward and be ready to receive all that God has for them. God has an awesome future plan for you. The Bible says it in Jeremiah 29, 11 and Ephesians 2, 10. That he has a great future pre-planned, pre-destined, pre-arranged that we might walk in it. All we have to do is walk in it. But you've got to be careful the image that you have of yourself. To be honest, some people who have a little image of themselves are some of the ones who can't serve other people because they already feel so little and so worthless that now they're out looking for some big fancy job so they feel like they got worth. There's nothing worse than somebody who's called to do some act of service and they're trying to be a preacher or a worship leader or the head of the company and they're miserable all their life because they're trying to be something that they're not. Find out what you're good at, find out what you're comfortable with and start doing it. Did you hear me? Find out what you're good at, find out what you're comfortable with and start doing it. Find out what you're good at, find out what you're comfortable with and start doing it. You say, well, I love to bake. Okay, then bake for everybody. I love kids. Well, babysit for some people. Just start doing what you can do. And God will probably multiply your gifts and he'll increase the anointing on your life. But don't ever despise the small things that God calls you to. Mephibosheth was a young boy that had a little image of himself. And because he had a little image of himself, he lived a little life. Go to 2 Samuel 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. You can make a long sermon out of this, but I'm going to try to keep it reasonably short. Verse 1. David said, Is there still any one of the house of Saul to whom I might show kindness for Jonathan's sake? David and Jonathan had a covenant relationship. Even though Jonathan was dead, David was now king and he wanted to bless any of his relatives that were still remaining. You have a covenant with God, and if you live your life right, God will bless your kids. I said, God will bless your kids. 400 years after David was dead, there was still somebody in his bloodline sitting on the throne because God promised him that. And many of his relatives got mercy, and the Bible says, Be for the sake of David and the covenant I made with him, I will give you mercy. And I believe if you serve God and you're praying for your family, that God will show some of them mercy just because of you. Come on now. So David went looking for somebody to be kind to. I love that spirit. I love that aggressive spirit. You have to get to the point where you say, I've got the spirit of God in me and God is a giver. And I've got to give. I can't be happy if I'm not giving. I can't be happy if I'm not serving. I can't be happy if I'm not making somebody else's life better. I can't just sit around and just my life be filled with nothing, but what about me, what about me, what about me? And so he went out looking for somebody to bless. Now, there's a whole message I teach on that too because I believe that, you know, we don't need to wait until we get three angel appearances and four prophecies to go be a blessing to somebody. <laughs> go look for people. Look around you. Watch. See what you can do for people. We've got one man who comes to our meetings. I, I, don't, I don't know if he's here this weekend or not, but he comes to a lot of them and we call him the tape table stalker. <laughs> and he's been doing this now for two or three years. He comes to our meetings and he has one sole purpose. He hangs around out in the lobby and he watches for people that look like they would like to have tapes but can't buy them and he goes and buys them what they want. <laughs> Instead, sometimes we have people fighting over buying the last tape on love. <laughs> well, I want that. Well, I got here first. Well, I had my hand on it. Well, you're not going to get it. Well, you're not going to get it. I had two women fighting over a seat one night in the front row and they both, both of them refused to get out of it so they both sat there. <laughs> oh, like, Hello. Everybody say, I'm gonna be a blessing on purpose. I'm gonna look for people to bless. Do you mean it? Yes. 
It'll be life changing if you'll do that. Pray every day. God, show me somebody I can bless. And then watch. So they did tell him about Mephibosheth, who was actually the son of Jonathan. But he was a cripple, and he was living in a little muddy hole called Lodibar. And actually, the way he got crippled was when David became king, his servants were lied to, and they said, David's going to be a bad king, and he's going to kill all of you. And so his nurse grabbed him and started to run, and she fell, fell down the steps with him, and he became crippled in his feet. So David now sends somebody out to this place where Mephibosheth is living, and he invites him to come to the king's house and eat because he is a rightful heir because of his relationship with Jonathan. You, because of your relationship with Jesus, have, are, are joint heir with him. It wasn't about what, Mesh, what Mephibosheth had done or not done. He was part of the covenant. David had a covenant with Jonathan we have a covenant with Jesus, and because of our covenant with Jesus, God wants to bless us. Is there anybody in the church that I might be able to bless for Jesus' sake, the Father's saying? Well, quit having that false humility. I'm just a dead dog living out in Lodi Bar. <laughs> just a grasshopper. No, you need to shake off all that wrong self-image. And you need to say, here I am, God, you've blessed me. Woo, woo, right here, God, here I am. Whoa, whoa. You need to get aggressive in your attitude. Be bold in your praying. The Bible says God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that we could ever dare. You gotta be a little daring. I think it even is more exciting. Every time you start to pray boldly, the devil says you don't deserve it, you say, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> that just makes it all the better. Come on, don't let the devil keep getting the upper hand over you. Stop letting him lie to you and ruin everything that Jesus wants to give you. Start talking back to him. You know the word, start using it. Verse 7. David said to him, Fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, your grandfather, and you shall eat at my table always. And the cripple bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? And I could go on and read more of that, but I've made my point. If he would have not had a wrong self-image, I'm talking to you today about how do you feel about yourself. You cannot determine your worth and value by the mistakes you've made in your life. You have to understand when you accept Christ, all of that is under the blood. And now you have the same rights and privileges as anybody else who's accepted Christ. Do you understand me? You may not have had a great past, but you can have a great future. But you are gonna have to go out and take what God has made available for you. And this is the place where people miss it. We keep waiting for it to fall on us and it's not going to. God told Joshua, every place on which the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I given unto you. You go take the land. You gotta go take the land. And this is a very important thing for me to get across to people because some people are just passive and they just have this apathetic, bad attitude. And they're like, well, you know, I wish God would bless me, but I you know, I'd like to be blessed. And I wish me to be 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 to be. No, you got to shake off that stuff, and you got to say, "I see it in the Word. What's mine? And it's not about me. It's about Jesus. And I'm going to take what is mine, one step at a time. I'm not ever going to quit. I'm not ever going to give up. From now until the day Jesus comes back to get me, I'm going to be taking new ground, and no devil in hell is going to stop me." Amen. God told Joshua, everything that I promised Moses, I will do it through you. Every place on which the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I already given to you. It's yours, but you got to take it. You got to have a right spirit, a persevering spirit, 
a steadfast spirit. The Bible says Caleb had a different spirit than the rest of the world. When he was 85 years old, he asked God to give him a mountain. Do you hear me? 85. And when they were dividing up the land, he said, I want that piece right over there with the mountain on it. He didn't ask for some little nice, flat, plowed piece of ground. He said, no. I've got the same strength I had when I was 45. Give me that mountain. You know, I know a lot of people like to hide their age, especially when they get up in years, but I tell people everywhere I go how old I am. And you know why? Because I think it's awesome we're still just out there trucking for Jesus and doing more now than we ever have in our whole life. And I hope that I'm out here doing a conference when I'm 85 and 90. Amen? God told me recently, don't ever make a decision based on your age. You know why? It's your body that gets old, your spirit doesn't. And if you got the right spirit, you can do when you're 85 what you could do when you were 25, only now you can do it with some wisdom. Because you've already made your mistakes. People ask us, you know, it's funny. People say, well, you know, are you thinking about retirement? I want to ask you something. How do you retire from a call on your life? I can't figure that one out. I mean, if God got finished with me and it wasn't working anymore and there was no fruit, then I guess I would retire. But how do you just say, well, God, this is all great and things are still working and lots of souls are being saved and the world's being changed, but I'm just going to retire now. <laughs> you can't do that. I can't do that. It doesn't matter how old I am. I'm still asking God for mountains. Yeah. Amen? You can't, you know, it, it's not about that. Don't start thinking you're too old or you're too young or you're too this or you're too that. Just get out there and have a different spirit than the rest of the world and do what God's telling you to do, amen? You know, God might be touching some of you to go to Bible school and you think, well, you can't do that. I'm already 45. <laughs> you need to have a spirit on fire full of zeal, enthusiastic, stirred up. Get rid of that passive, lethargic, lazy, lukewarm, dumb thing that hangs on us. Here Mephibosheth is, he's sitting out in this little mud hole. See, I'm just a dead dog. <laughs> well, if you look at the last verse, he finally got the message. Verse 13, 2 Samuel 9, 13. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, even though he was lame in both feet. Now, there's such a message there that even though he had a flaw, come on, this is shouting ground, even though he had something wrong with him, he did not let, them, let that keep him out of the king's presence and he still went to the table and he ate the best and he lived in the best and he had the best and it wasn't because of him, it was because he had a covenant. Now Jacob, on the other hand, he had a totally different kind of spirit. I mean, this guy had been a rascal all of his life. Jacob and Esau were twins and Esau was born first, but Jacob came out of the womb hanging on to his brother's heel. It's almost like in the womb he was saying, you're not going to get ahead of me. <laughs> Trying to hold other people back so he could move forward and that's not the way to do it. You may not be familiar with all this, I don't have time to go over it, but he was a liar, a trickster, a schemer, a swindler, and a cheat. He stole his brother's birthright. He lied and stole the blessing of the firstborn. As a result of that, he had to run and hide all of his life from his brother because he was afraid that he was going to kill him. And finally one day, finally one day, he got fed up with running. And he decided it was time to face the issues.
and deal with the things in him that had gotten him in trouble. And the Bible says in Genesis 32, he left everything he had, his family and all of his goods, and he crossed over the brook and he got along with God and he wrestled with the angel of the Lord. And the angel said, leave me alone. And listen to this spirit. I will not leave you alone until you bless me. <laughs> wow. I will not leave you alone until you bless me. And then the Bible says, the angel said to him, what is your name? And now Jacob says, the Amplified says, in shock of realization. My name is Jacob, trickster, swindler, schemer, cheat, liar. That was his place of repentance. He realized what he'd been. And the angel said, your name shall no more be Jacob, but Israel. Now listen, listen. And that word means contender with God. For you have contended with God and with man, and you have prevailed. In other words, he wouldn't even let God go. I'm going to be blessed. I don't care what I am. It's not about what I am. I can receive forgiveness for what I am, and I can live under the covenant blessings of Jesus Christ. And I love this part. The angel touched the hollow of his thigh, and the rest of his life he had a limp. And I believe that that limp represents the weaknesses that God leave in us. So we realize when he blesses us how truly blessed we are and how we don't deserve what he does for us. Come on now. And so I always like to say it like this. Mephibosheth got up to the king's table and ate even though maybe somebody had to put him in the chair. And Jacob limped, but he limped off with his blessing.